Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to meet you, even a greater pleasure to have had the opportunity to listen to these students who are here from Pendleton. I am delighted to be here and absolutely delighted that we started at least this portion of the program in terms of uh, today's activities, that you um, had the, uh, the good taste, really, to start with uh, a musical uh, done by such extraordinary uh, musicians and talented students as, uh, as appeared here from, uh, from that district. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, and I say that largely because um, my, my conversation with you today is um, obviously uh, to share a little bit about um, the work that we're doing at the OEIB and more importantly, uh, the places and the ways by which um, this is going to be really sort of an ongoing conversation and an ongoing relationship uh, with Oregon School Board Association for a very long period of time. But, but also to suggest to you that, um, uh, you know, I, I watched these young people coming up here today and I was thinking to myself as a former teacher and a principal and so forth, I was thinking, well, wow, wow what, what would it take to get me to do that today? Um, what would it take to get any of us to do that? Um, we take heart in the extraordinary work that goes into uh, something like this, and I'm the son of a person who uh, was a jazz musician in New York City for a number of years, and, and I remembered thinking to myself, wow, this is, this is like hard work. It's extraordinary work. Um, and yet it is doable. And what these students model for us is the fact that hard work comes with an extraordinary teacher. It comes with extraordinary amounts of effort and to some degree sacrifice from parents and community. And more importantly, it comes with a lot of practice. So what we got a chance to see today was the culmination of all of that. And in some ways, it is therefore the point of departure for my conversation with you today. The work that we've been engaged in for some period of time, and this is a, a pretty exciting time in the state of Oregon, but the work that we've been engaged in has really been about trying to frame a set of issues that are so near and dear to the lifeblood and the ongoing uh, work of public education in the United States, that in due course, this work and this framework and this conversation will sort of find its way into the national discourse. That discourse has been one that in the last, oh goodness, 10 years, has almost been uh, fundamentally sort of driven by what number did you get on a test? How many tests do you give? What are the cut scores on the test? Well, in some ways, the formulation of this and the genius of the governor and the legislators who were insightful enough to see the reason behind doing something like this really gives us an opportunity to have a conversation outside the bandwidth of those conversations, those rather mundane conversations about whether or not the test is the right test, whether or not you have the right cut score, whether or not districts should cut, cut, have the cut score, whether or not it should be state-driven, and on and on and on. At the end of the day, the work that we're engaged in is about the, the ability for us to actually frame the educational discussion and frame the educational work in a way that may be more authentic and more honest and more forthright than anything we may have done in our entire careers. It's not just about academic adequacy, although that's true and important, and I'll talk a little bit about one element of that that we're going to be focusing on. But it's really about whether or not young people who, even if they are and as they are becoming more academically prepared, whether or not they actually know how to go out and get a job, whether or not they know how to follow their dreams, whether or not they know how to participate in a democracy, whether or not they actually know, by virtue of the kind of work we do, whether or not they actually know how to be a member of our civic community and to belong to a family that is bigger than their own. And how would that actually look if we were to think about that across the grades from P20? How would we structure a day or a year, 180 days, or whatever we have? How would we structure those experiences such that we actually ask young people to rise to a new level of humanity, the likes of which we need in a 21st century world? 
That is the conversation we are now actually trying to ignite writ large throughout this entire state. And some of the tensions inherent in that are tensions around whether or not we have an adequate funding base. Absolutely the right question and frankly the right tension. We've got to work our way through that. I'm not here today to hold out any particular dollar amount or funding uh, notion or any other thing, but rather to suggest to you that that's an issue that is in fact on the table. One that this legislature and this governor and this team at OEIB are going to have to wrestle with. But right now, the name of the game is let's get the game right. Let's ultimately understand how to frame what we would do even if we had more dollars, even if we had a longer day or a longer year. What would we spend it on? How would it be different and what would the experiences look like for young people as they go through what we call now a P20 system? So the framework here is not insignificant. The architecture now is bent very, very differently than when it once was. We now have the ability to talk with and engage deans and schools of education to think differently about the work and the purpose and the focus of ESDs, to engage parents in ways that maybe we've never even thought about engaging them in the past, and most importantly, to think about commissions and boards and a whole host of other governing bodies, not in, notwithstanding yours, then how would we all get on the same hymn page and sing from the same book? On behalf of thousands of children, thousands of young people who are ultimately asking us to create a new highway for them to be able to walk or run or sprint across so that they can actually be both gainfully employed but also valued as they go forward into a new world. So my comments with you really, uh, brief as they may be, are really about what that work looks like so far and sort of how we'll think more about uh, ways by which we can shoulder the, the, the collective responsibility of doing it. So I want to say a little bit about uh, the ideas that are on the table. Many of you may have heard them or you may have heard me speak about them or others on the staff or perhaps read about them. The idea here is to invest in public education, to really start to think about strategically where would you put more money, different money? How would you use this differently? The governor asked that we all think about that, and in the process of thinking about it, I said, well, there would be about four areas that if I were you know, really, really, really thoughtful about this, that I would say, you know what, for not only the next biennium, but frankly for about the next five years, that I would ask school boards and I would ask commissions and boards and people to really start unpacking and putting their shoulder to a wheel of a real initiative that ultimately is focused on doing some different work in these areas. The first area was I would actually say, you know what, we need as a state to focus and function differently in reading. That as young people actually try to acquire the skill of reading, we find that we are standing here today or sitting here today and looking at results that come out very disparate. You've got easily a third of students for whom this is really a very, very, very different outcome. It isn't to say that they can't read or that they won't be able to read. It is to say that right now they are demonstrating that they are not at proficiency level. And then when you look at the number of children whose first language is English, is not English, and what their reading proficiency level is, it's even lower than that. So what we have is a state that's actually growing in size in terms of who's coming in, the demographics, the, the diversity of our state. And then when I look at the numbers, I think, wow, we've actually got to create new and different pathways for young people to particularly get this skill right. Now, why is this important? It's important because it is the primary human skill, the likes of which all other attributes of your life are a function of. If you cannot read, you really almost can't function. If you cannot read, you can't get a job. If you can't get a job, you can't take care of your family. If you can't take care of your family, you actually have no sense of self-worth. And in more importantly, you begin to actually function as a wounded person. And what I know about wounded people, they are, I am no psychologist, but what I know about wounded people is that they wound other people over time. And so our job, fundamentally, is to organize what resources we have and what organization we have, both internal and external to the P20 system, around how would we support 
student literacy in a way that actually gets everybody, not some, not the majority, not whether or not you know, you're in a special ed program or you're not in a special ed program or you're an ELL program or you're this or you're that. Forget those titles for a second. This is the same thing that we are asking teachers to do, which is to essentially get everybody to a level of proficiency such that they have a life available to them. And a life through the, lo through the love and joy, really, of being literate. Now, I happen to have taught English, and I love classic literature. And I never would have known that as a kid growing up in New York City that I would have loved classic literature. I got stumbled on, if you will, gerunds and participles. I hated them and probably still do. And most of you, if you really step back for a moment, you'd say to yourself, but for someone who gave me the vision and the insight and ultimately the joy of learning something, I would still be stuck on those things as well. So this issue of reading is really about how do we take early learners and make reading joyous. Give people a chance as they come into the world of learning in a formal sense from zero to five, zero to three, but give them a chance to ultimately feel the power of words and the magic of dreaming and reading about worlds maybe far beyond their own. This is a place where dreams do come true, but it starts with the fundamental skill of being able to read. And equal to that, and a second investment, if you will, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute, but a second investment would be around parents. And how would we help parents to actually understand not just how reading functions in our school, but how can they in their home build a value around learning and around the joy of reading such that they actually both have books available, use libraries more often, have, if you will, opportunities for young people to explore and have fun in the course of the day, the year, the month, over the course of intercession, uh, holidays, etc. But how would we create new and different excitement among parents around this very, very important skill?